enough uh, from their regular uh, pensions to be able to take care of their children and their family in their absence. But what have you put in place? And so it is important, as you will know through this webinar, that you have to actively plan for your retirement. You need to put things together for your retirement. That's why NPRA had this three-tier pension scheme that they have brought to be able to help you and I. Um, I won't speak much, but to let you know that uh, retirement will come whether you like it or not. And it is important that you properly prepare. You prepare based on set principles. You prepare based on reasonable principles. And you prepare in order to favor not just you, uh, but your dependent as well. Um, the HSOPS has you at heart. We are interested in your affairs, and we're going to do everything possible to help you and then uh, be able to put together a fairly good retirement that would help you to retire with a smile. I pray that we all enjoy this uh, session. Uh, you can put down your questions, and I'm sure they will answer them. Thank you so much, and God bless you all. Thank you, Pep. You can take over. Thank you very much, Dr. Derek. I'm Martin, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Health Sector occupational pension scheme. Indeed, we are happy to have you with us. So um, at this time, I want to encourage you all again, send out the message to your colleagues and friends and tell them that it is not too late. They should still register and join the webinar and learn something towards their retirements. Uh, you may be working now, you are fit, but you never know what holds out for you tomorrow. We all can pray and hope for the best. Nobody knows tomorrow. So understand some of these things so that you can plan your life effectively. Like I said earlier, um, the retirement planning series has been put in place by the Education Committee of the Health Sector Occupational Pension Scheme. This is the first of the series and a number more of these webinars will be coming your way in the nearest future. At this time, if you have any questions, as we are going to start the main presentation and other presentations, kindly do well to put it in the chat box. We'll pick it up later and answer them for you. At this time, I'm privileged to uh, hand over the platform to Mr. Ransford Matekoli, who is our main speaker for today. As I introduced him earlier, he is the head, um, the new business advisory of enterprise trustees. And he has over 13 working experience in the financial services sector, spanning across insurance and pensions. Mr. Ransford Matekoli, we are very happy to have you here. Please, Thank over you, to sir. you. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to be here. Um, once again, good morning to everybody. <clears throat> and um, I also like to welcome everybody to um, today's session. We, as Pepe Charles um, indicated, we will be speaking um, on a general overview of retirement planning. Um, a few things to take note of. We will be going into what retirement actually means to us, and um, um, a few steps to consider when planning for your retirement, pitfalls to avoid, and some basic tips to help us here and there. And um, also some opportunities that um, exist for every worker, um, both in the formal sector and the informal sector, um, around the pensions, um, the pension space when it comes to um, retirement planning. And then we can take some questions. So as Chairman said, um, retirement is going to come, whether we like it or not, whether we are prepared for it or not. So when we can, or when we are able to, let's start with the um, with the planning. So. We define retirement as a time in life when um, your main source of income moves from or changes from end income to investment income. This means that it's a period in, in your life where you're no longer going to be receiving um, monthly income from your employer, but now you're going to be surviving on investment returns um, from investment that you've been able to put aside or um, retirement funds that you've been able to um, set aside for this period. So now, things are changing. Uh, you are, you've either been forced out of, um, you've either been forced um, into retirement or you've gone into retirement voluntary. Forced meaning mandatory retirement, which is 60. The law says once you're 60, you have to retire mandatory. Um, voluntary retirement, 
as early as 55 or in some cases 50. So it can be forced or voluntary withdrawal from the from the job market. But either way, it's a time that we are all going to come to. Once we're born, we will live through the stages of life and retirement is um, one of the very crucial stages. So as um as people in the pension space or people that have some knowledge of pensions, we always try to speak to um, everybody we come in contact with about retirement planning and the importance of retirement planning, why we need to plan for retirement. So in this very brief session, I'm just going to touch on a few things that we need to um, consider, especially um, factors that we need to consider when planning for, for retirement. So the retirement planning is the preparation process for life after um, paid work ends. So we're saying that now paid work has ended. You are now going into the second phase of your retirement, the second phase of your life. So what are some of the things that we need to um, consider in this in this retirement planning process? Um, the very the very first one, which is one of the most important ones, is to identify your all your sources of income. OK, and by saying this, we mean going beyond just your um, your basic salary that you receive. There are other sources of income that you have coming in. Um, most people have some side, um, you know, some side hustle or some side gig that they do. Maybe they um, do a little business on the side um, besides their nine to five, or they have um, some kind of um, family investment where they receive some returns every month or some additional stipends coming in from um, some family inheritance or whatever, whichever um, source that income is coming from we have to identify it and note it down as one of the sources. So we are not just going to focus on your basic salary. We're going to focus on all sources of income that you have. So we want to look at all that is coming in and put a plan in place for it. Um, the second thing is to estimate your expenses. Each and every one of us on this call um, has a fair idea of their monthly expenses, how much you spend in um, every month on food, on accommodation, i.e. rent or mortgage, on utility bills, on school fees, um, on basic, you know, basic, basic necessities. Everybody has a fair idea, but it's good to put it down in writing. So you 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 know have a little chart and put all your expenses down from the biggest expenses, um, i.e. rent or mortgage payment to school fees. So even the smallest one, the you know, the little killer really that you buy on your way home from work, or maybe the little tip that you even give um, somebody here and there. You, they are all part of your expenses. And the reason we need to document it is some of these expenses follow you into retirement. There are some that will cease um, by the time you're retiring, but majority of them will follow you into retirement. So if you're going to continue having these expenses, um, because they are recurring expenses into retirement, then you need to have a plan around it. So you know how much you're spending currently um, and you know how much you're going to be spending by the time you are retiring, maybe in 10, 15 or 20 years. So it's good to estimate those expenses as well. And then put a savings program in place. It's good to have a plan in your head, um, but sometimes when it's in your head, that's all it is. It stays in your head. Put it down on paper, put it down into writing. This is my savings program that I'm putting in. I'm saying that every month, I'm, look, I'm um, looking at all my inflows, um, all my sources from all my sources of income, and I'm committing this percentage, maybe a 20% or maybe a 30% into a special savings um, fund or a special retirement um, portfolio or, or fund that I'm setting up. Okay, so that is my savings plan. Okay, maybe um, I have very big plans for my retirement. So maybe what is coming in as my inflows now will not be enough. So I need to maybe get a second job or maybe I need to start something on the side. That is also a plan. You are, all, you are, you are coming up with all these very, um, very impressive plans. You need to put them down on paper. So have a very good um, savings plan that, you, that you'll be able to implement. The fourth thing is considering your life and your health insurance um, covers. It's very important that um, you have a life cover. You have a life insurance cover. It's very important. And I'll, 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 I say this for a lot of reasons. Um, number one on that list is such that if you had to pass today, um, you don't want a situation where your beneficiaries would have to use your um, retirement income to bury you or to um, 
uh, to take care of prenatal expenses that will arise out of that. Or even when you are in retirement and a loved one passes away, you don't want to commit your retirement funds to um, funeral arrangements and so on and so forth. So it's good to have a life insurance cover for yourself and covering your um, beneficiaries and your dependents as well. And also a health insurance cover. So it's good to speak to a private health provider um, for some kind of health insurance cover that will extend into your retirement years to supplement what the national health insurance will, um, will provide for you. That goes without saying that we should all at least as a bare minimum have the health insurance, um, the national health insurance um, cover that um, the government provides. We should have that as a bare minimum and then also look into having a supplementary health insurance cover because healthcare costs is one of the biggest drains on um, people's retirement portfolio, retirement funds. It's one of the biggest drains because a lot of people will come, a lot of people, you know, develop illnesses in their, um, in their age, in their old age, or um, after retirement, you know, for various reasons. Yes, you can have a very healthy lifestyle after retirement. Granted, we thank God for that, but in the events that you have health issues, you should be able to have um, um, an insurance cover that will cover you. So you don't end up using all your um, your retirement fund to take care of your health in your retirement. And the last one will be to review our employment compensations and benefits. One mistake we usually make um, when we are starting a new job is um, negotiating for bigger allowances because the tax implications on allowances are quite small. So people would rather favor um, um, uh, a bigger allowance compared to um, a bigger basic, but this is where we have we are having it all wrong. Our uh, pensions calculations, it's made on our basic and not our um, our allowances. So it's very important that you bargain or you negotiate for a, a bigger uh, percentage of your remuneration to go to your basic. Okay, so people have an issue with this because they say they want their they want their money now. Um, they want their money now, so they would rather have it as allowances and they can spend it now. But the now is important, but not as important as the tomorrow. And we need to consider the tomorrow now because you have the you you could live many, many, many years after retirement. And if you are going to be living 30, 40, God can bless you, you may live 30, 40 years more on after your retirement and if you are going to be living that long what are you going to be surviving on so it's very important to think about the future more than uh, more than that today so when we are changing jobs or when we even have the opportunity to um, have um, contract renegotiations in our current portfolios it's very important to negotiate more for increased um, basic rather than um, increased allowances okay all right, so why do we need to plan for retirement? I stated earlier on that we we have certain um, expenditure that never ceases, okay? So they are called recurring expenditure, um, set like utility bills, um, like healthcare bills, um, like accommodation. There are certain uh, costs that, or expenses that do not end. They never end. They, for as long as you're alive, you will still be taking care of those expenses. and. These recurring expenses need to be taken care of. So if you are going into retirement where you are going to be experiencing reduced reduction in your income because you are no longer going to be re um, receiving uh, a monthly wage or a monthly salary from your employer, then that means that you need to have some funds to take care of these um, recurring expenditure. Okay, and it's important that you don't go into debt, um, you don't go into debt doing this. So you need to consider having a proper retirement fund, okay, to take care of this. I also mentioned the increased healthcare um, costs in old age. And for me, this is the most important one. You deserve a comfortable retirement. You've worked 20, 30, 35 years of your life, day in, day out, morning to, morning to um, dusk till dawn. Now is the time for you to retire. Now is the time for you to enjoy the fruits of your labor. So this is not the time for you to um, believe in basic. I don't believe in that. You work hard. You need to retire comfortably. How do you do that? Have a very good retirement plan in place so you can be able to build a proper retirement portfolio that you'd be able to afford the kind of retirement that you do deserve because 
you do you god knows you deserve it so for me this is the most important one you you need to plan for retirement because you deserve a comfortable retirement when we talk about the stages of retirement planning um we usually break them down into three um stages of our life as a as um a human being okay um it starts as early as um what we call the young adulthood and this is between the ages of 21 to 35 and this is the stage where and most people would be starting um, their working life. They would probably be fresh out of school or maybe starting a business on their own. But yeah, this is the beginning of a lot of things um, for a lot of people, okay? The thing about this um, period in your life is you, you are just starting out, okay? So you may not be making so much. You may not have so much money to invest. But the good thing about it is you have the time. Time is on your side. And the best time is when you are young. That is the best time when you are young because the principle of compounding interest is a savior to us in this um, in this um, in this scenario. It's a savior to us in this scenario because you are able to have funds managed longer. So what's going to happen is your funds are going to grow for a longer period, and because of the principle of compounding interest, you are going to be have been a bigger portfolio by the time you are retiring. So you take someone that's um, probably 35, uh, 21, uh, 25, sorry, they have about 35 years until retirement. That's a that's a mighty long time. But the downside about this period is usually people in this, um, people that fall in this group or when people are in this group, they're not really earning much. So it's easy to um, start thinking about or oh, putting retirement planning or retirement proceeds in, at the, in, uh, on the back burner, but that is the mistake we make here. The, um, the, the suggestion here or the advice here is to start regardless of how small, start with something small, but what's important is the frequency and the consistency. So start with something small, but on a monthly basis, you are consistently contributing to it. You are consistently contributing to it month in, month out without fail. And that's how it's going to grow. So now the time is going to work on um, your compounding interest for you. Then you come to the second stage. You come to the second stage, which is um, we would call the early midlife. So that's 36, between the ages of 36 to 50 years. Now, this is the stage where a lot of people are now starting family life. So you'd have um, people getting married, people starting to have families, people probably now going into their second um, jobs. I mean, they are starting a, um, a job in a second, in a in a new, um, a totally new environment, and so on and so forth. Some would now probably at this stage be applying for a mortgage or be applying for certain loans to help them take care of um, certain pressing needs. Yes, and so on and so forth. Now, at this stage, people's um, disposable income are increasing because now you've been working for, you know, 5, 10, maybe 12 years. So now your disposable income is increasing. But at the same time, your expenses are also rising as well. So you need to find a very good balance. OK, so the combination of earning more money and the time that you still have to invest and earn interest makes um, these years, you know, some of the best years for aggressive savings because now you have the time and you have the resources, okay? You have the um, disposable income to match it. So you need to watch your expenses very carefully um, in this stage so you can still be able to continue um, with your retirement savings plan that you had started. And if you haven't already started one, this is a good time. At the next good time to start is this stage because you have lost, you have lost some time already, but not that it's it's not too late this is the second best time for you to start then we have the latter midlife which is um, 51 to 65 years um this at this stage you are almost at retirement stage or even entering the retirement stage so one thing you realize is you have a lot more income now than the second stage because at this stage you would have you have um you most like you most likely have finished paying off all your loans that you have your children may have um, completed school now so you're no longer paying school fees if you have a mortgage you'd have paid it off by this by this period so you you have a lot more disposable income but what you don't have is time so it means you're going to have to put a lot more away to be able to achieve um your your set goal or your set target for um your your retirement that you 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 have in mind okay all right. So in saying that, um, I'd just like to go back 
um, quickly to the three tier pension structure. Okay, um, because of the three tiers that we have, um, tier one, tier two being mandatory, um, adding up to 18.5%. The provision is provision has been made for us in this by giving us a third tier, which is the, um, the tier three voluntary um, provident fund and then personal pension scheme. So this is where an individual can take charge of his own retirement and say, okay, I want to do more than the tier one, tier two that my employer is doing on my behalf. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to sign up to a personal pension and I will treat it as my personal retirement portfolio or my personal retirement plan. Okay, and I will contribute X amount to it. Thankfully, we do enjoy some benefits um, when contributing to the three tier pension structure and um, key amongst those are, is the tax waiver. So you have up to 16.5% tax exemption. Um, so far as you are contributing to your personal pensions or a tier three problem fund. Okay, so this is an opportunity for us to sign up and and and, and some um, um, save some taxes, save on some um, on, on some taxes for this particular one, and that those savings that we're making can go into our retirement portfolio um, fund that we are building. Okay. Um, another thing is it also gives us uh, the opportunity to set up a dedicated retirement fund, and we now have more control um, over our retirement readiness than we used to than before, because now we have the opportunity to sign up to um, personal pensions which is under the three-tier pension structure. So it's actually very secure and it's actually very secure and you are guaranteed of a peaceful, um, of a peaceful um, retirement um, when the time comes. Now in all this planning that we are talking about, it's important to take note of a few things, a few you know, pitfalls that you need to avoid or a few mishaps that you need to avoid so that you don't make certain errors or certain errors in judgments when it comes to retirement planning. Um, so we'll just go through a few of them. We need to, you know, get over get over the reliance on mandatory pension schemes. Okay. We seem to be too reliant on it. A lot of people that you engage on retirement planning or um yeah re on retirement planning will tell you that oh my employer um has tier one tier two for me so I am okay. Oh um I run my own company and I have set up tier one, tier two for myself and my staff, so I'm okay. Now that's the thing. Tier one, tier two is basic pension. It's basic and it's, it is what the name says it is, it's basic. It's just enough to keep body and soul together when you go into retirement, okay? Tier one, tier two estimates about 65% of your last paycheck. And if you are currently barely making ends meet with your full paycheck, imagine having to do that with 65% of your current paycheck. That would be very difficult. And that's what tier one and tier two will be giving you by the time you are retiring. So obviously that will not be enough. So then there's the need to make additional voluntary contributions to your own retirement, your own way, okay? Um, another mistake that a lot of people make is drawing down on their PF contribution, on their PF benefits when they change jobs. Um, usually when you're working with um, an institution, they would, they would have um, a, tier, a tier three PF um, provident fund set up for you and all your other um, employees, your fellow employees. When you're moving per the scheme rules, most of the time you are allowed to draw down on the, on the tier three PF and do whatever you want to do with it. So people see it as, an opportunity to, to cash in early on their on their peer, but that's where we're wrong. Um, it's not free money. It's money that was being put aside for your retirement initially. Okay, so if you're changing jobs and you're going to have access to it now, it makes sense to continue contributing to it. So you can you can have it transferred to um, your new trustee that you're going to be with. Okay, or if you are moving to another employer who is with the same trustee, then keep it and continue contributing to it. Let's not be in haste to draw down on the PF because we feel it's free money. It's not. It's money that was set up or set aside for our retirement. So let's keep it that way, okay? Uh, and from experience in this country, things don't usually get better. They usually get harder. So in 10 years time, whatever you think, whatever heat you think you're feeling now will even be hotter. Wouldn't you rather want to have something to help you cool down on with that heat? in 10 years 
than say, oh, I, I, I think I had now, I can't start now. So maybe next year or maybe next month. And then the 10 years will come and you haven't even started and the heat gets worse. So times are hard, yes, but it's actually the best time to put something away, okay? Um, another mistake people usually make is not updating their beneficiaries. Uh, it's very important that we update our beneficiaries every now and then. Most people um, get signed on to um, SNED, get signed on to uh, tier two when they start working. And at that time, most people may be single. So they may name um, maybe a, just a, um, a parent or a brother or a distant relative as their beneficiary. Now, when you get married, it's important that you come update your beneficiaries now with your spouse's name. And when you have children, it's important to update them. If you have more children, it's important to update them as well. So at every point in time, your beneficiary data is updated. If something is to happen to you, touch wood, you have to follow. We know who we are going to call. So if we go on and there's nobody to call, then that's a problem. Now there's a problem for your dependents that you've left behind because they were not named beneficiaries. Now they have to go through to the courts and get a lot of administration, which costs so much time and there'll be a lot of back and forth before they can have access to something that would have easily taken just a couple of days for them to um, um, have access to. Okay, so it's very important that we update our beneficiaries and we also check our pensions contributions regularly. There's no wait till we are almost 55 or well, close to retirement before we start checking our pension statement. Let's check them today. Let's check them every month. Let's make sure our employer is making the contributions that they're supposed to be making on our behalf regularly. If we identify any gaps immediately, let's draw that, let's draw the attention to it. If we don't, if we don't check our, 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 our contribution statements, we will be waiting, 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 and then three, four years until retirement, we pick our uh, statements up and you realize there are gaps. Now reconciliation becomes a problem. That's one. And two, you would have lost so much interest. Imagine if you had gaps that date as far back as 15 years, you'd have lost all that interest. You'd have lost all that interest. So it's very important that we check our pensions contributions regularly, okay? and also have a documented retirement plan, all right? And as I said earlier on, paying attention to your health and your social life. It's all part of retirement planning. You, you need to, you don't just get up and do certain things, decide to get married, decide to have, you need to plan them. So how does my, how does getting married this year or next year fit into my retirement plan? How does having children at a certain age or by a certain age fit into my retirement plan? Yes. Granted, um, a lot of this would be, um, we look to God for a lot of this, but we also need to plan because he, 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 he works with your plan sometimes, okay? So it's good to have a plan in place. I want to get married by a certain age and have children by a certain age so that I will be done paying school fees by a certain age. That's, it's, 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 it's just an example. I'm not saying everybody should go down that route, but to each his own, to each his own, whichever one works for you, pick it and move with it. But there should be a plan. There should be a plan around your, your social life, your your marriage, your relationships, your childbirth. There should be a plan, okay? All right. Um, just look at a few basic tips um, for you to consider in your retirement planning. As I stated earlier, it's very important to start early. If you're not able to start early, it's never too late. But it's very important that we start early. We save as early as we can, as much as we can, okay? Because of the power of compounding interest, we will be in a good space. The second thing is to get into a savings mindset. You need to remember that you need to plant it, a seed to grow a tree, okay? Trees don't just pop up from anywhere. You need to plant seeds to grow a tree. You have a plan in place. You want to achieve something. You work towards it. Avoid general savings. Be more targeted with your savings plan. If you have, what the, the problem is, the problem with having a save, uh, general savings is if you have a general savings, anytime something occurs, you touch. Anytime something occurs, you dip your hand into it. Anytime something occurs, you dip your hand into it. But when you have specific savings, so I have a savings plan for my retirement and my retirement alone. I have a specific um, retirement fund set aside for maybe paying off my children's school fees by a certain age. That is there. I have a specific um, retirement portfolio set up for this, for that. That's being targeted with your um, retirement planning. So you're not leaving anything to chance, okay? You need to plan your retirement like all other stages of your life. 
you plan other things. You plan what you're going to do next week. You plan what you're going to do this weekend. There's a holiday coming up next week. Yeah, you already have plans of what you're going to do. Why don't you plan what you're going to do 15 years from now when you're retiring, okay? Fourth one is to define your retirement. I said this a couple of times. Um, that's estimating all your recurring expenses, um, your utilities, transportation, and feed and estimating them and knowing how much they are going to cost you when you are going into retirement and making sure that you have enough um, in your retirement kitty. Okay, and always make sure you subscribe to medical, uh, private medical um, insurance tailored for retirees to supplement what the um, National Health Insurance um, offer will give you. So this slide just goes to speak about my uh, earlier comment on starting your retirement journey very early. So this is... Um, this is a scenario that we did for six members um, with different age ranges from 25 to 50, um, giving them a goal of saving up to a million um, by the time they are 60. Now, if you look at the person that's 25, it's going to need as little as 90 Ghana cities um, to start with and still at 90 Ghana cities to reach that goal by the time they are 60 in 35 years. And we did this using a 15% annual um, growth of interest and then a 10% annual increment in your contributions. So a 25-year-old will need as, just as little as 90 cities every month. But for a 45-year-old, they'll need as much as 1,641. So there's hope for all of us, but the younger we are, the more, um, the more advantage we have to reach this goal. Um, when you're going into retirement, there are just a few things to um, consider or to look at when you finally get into retirement. And one important one is to downsize, okay? You don't need that five bedroom or six bedroom house in your retirement. Your children by that age would be grown and married and moved out of your house. You're going to be in a six bedroom house by yourself. Cleaning is a problem, taking care of it is a whole mess. You don't need that seven seater vehicle. You don't need that big vehicle in your retirement. Downsize into a two bedroom, easier to manage. Downsize to a smaller sedan, easier to manage. You can take you everywhere. Also, it's important to socialize a lot in your retirement. Um, statistics show that most people, um, most people, most deaths uh, post retirement occur within the first five years. And Now people get swamped, people get overwhelmed. So in your planning, you are also considering your social circles as well. Okay, so it's very good to socialize and also exercise in your retirement. And do not commit your retirement funds to capital intensive projects. When you are about near retirement, that's not the time to go buy land to start a five bedroom apartment or a block of apartments that you want to live. Uh, you want to live on the, the, the proceeds, the rent proceeds in your retirement, because it's going to take you five, six years, and it's going to swallow up about two million cities of your retirement fund. Rent, um, rent income at to commit your retirement funds to capital intensive um, um, projects. You can start the project whilst you're in active work and complete it when you are retiring, but not to start these projects when you are entering retirement. So, members, in closing, I just like to remember, I just like to remind everybody um, to save for specific needs and to avoid general savings. I like to remind everybody that retirement is the only goal that you cannot take a loan from, okay? And you cannot take a loan for. And you remember, you have to plant a seed to grow a tree. And we plan to fail if we fail to plan. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much um, for your time this morning. But um, Perpetual, I think I'll hand the mic back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ransford, Matekole, for that brilliant presentation. Um, I like the closing very much. And I think we have all learned a lot from this presentation. Um, keep, keep on sending your questions through the Q&A chat box. Um, we are noting all of them. And at the time for question and answers, we'll read them out and give you appropriate answers. At this time, it is also important that you invite your friends and colleagues to join. It's not just even about the health sector. 
uh, mother workers can join in. The retirement planning goes for everybody. Use the Q&A chat box and put in your questions and we'll answer them later. At this time, we are going to invite Mr. Andrews Aplobi, um, who is going to shed a little more light. I know Mr. Ransford, my take touched on this. He talked about updating beneficiary list, but uh, Mr. Andrews Aplobi is also going to talk about it briefly and is going to um, center it more to the health sector occupational pension scheme and what we require of all of you as contributors. So, Ms. Ablobi, please, you have the floor. Um, I'm grateful. Uh, it's a pleasure meeting all of you. Uh, I want to share my slides with you right now uh, as I begin this. Um, indeed, yes, our um, earlier speaker has been able to uh, touch on a number of issues concerning retirement planning. Uh -huh. So what I want to do is to add on, uh, more especially when it comes to uh, the member update he did indicate it. So let me try and share my slide now. So I will go straight to that part of member update without um, giving a lot more other things so that you know we can be more um, within the retirement planning, as he said. So let me go there quickly. Um, as he indicated, you know, uh, I want to just add quickly, in the health sector of pension and pension scheme, the board of trustees have put in a robust system where when it comes to those who are retired, benefits are paid. So there is a system for a process of benefit payment that cut across, uh, I would say, from the administrator through the trustees and then the custodian where the payments are made. Now, because we are talking about retirement planning, you know, it's very important that um, <clears throat> we are able to do what we need to do on a regular basis as uh, we are planning. Uh, things like member update, you know, um, especially when you are looking at benefit payment at that end where the person has come, you see that a lot of issues uh, crop up. For example, things to do with date, uh, a date of birth. We know, yeah, we are all born once. But I'm sure you know we are in Africa or Ghana where we have the football age, we have some other day age, you know, but let's let's make as much as possible that when we are uh, looking at those information that is being held in our uh, system, try to make sure that you have the correct uh, date of birth, you know, and especially when it comes to the SNIT pension scheme or others, uh, they always will go by the date that you give them, you know, so you may have a date of birth if your employer, but make sure that these are all uh, tidy and then make sure you want to have your right uh, date of birth. Uh, the date you, you, you join the, the, the organization or you start contributing, you know, it's always good once you are making this update to make sure that, you know, uh, they are intact. Your email, these are basic things, but you see, uh, why do we need them as a, a, tr a trustee? Uh, we need them because, you see, we will have to get in touch with you. For example, if you need a statement like this webinar, you know, a blast is being sent through what we call SMS. We need your phone. Without a phone, when that blast is sent, you may not be rich, you know. Uh -huh. So these are all. So once you change your phone number, please let us know. Anytime you change your phone number, my test is also very important. You know, uh, probably you filled the enrollment form where you were a uh, single, but now you've married, you know. Let us, because these are continuing processes, because it's more of a relationship, you know, with the trustees. So as much as you have your, uh, your money in there, make sure this information, if you are divorced, let us know. You know, because sometimes you come to a place where this person may not be available to answer some of the questions, but you are filling your enrollment, your enrollment form that you are a married person. Probably maybe you are divorced, you know, and you may no longer be there. All these affect how benefit you know, are, 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 are seen. So it's very important, your home address, you know, let us know this as we go ahead. Financial data, very, very key. So these are things that we are expecting that as a member planning for retirement planning, especially when it comes to the health spread across everywhere, we are expecting that our members, you know, will keep on on a regular basis, make sure that this data, because data we are saying that is an oil now as we are in, in, uh, looking at it, you know, so make sure that we have the right data for you. You know, the statement, you know, as much as you can do, use the phones to check the statements. Yes, 
make sure that we, the statement that we have on you is the right statement, you know, uh, the salary that your amount is paid. Imagine you have been, you have uh, probably you have been promoted in a particular year. You know, you have to ensure that, you know, it reflects in your uh, 5% calculations, you know, so keep an eye on it. Give it essential attention to these things. You don't wait to work the last period. Like the earlier uh, uh, presenter said, you know, you may be losing in some level of what we call interest calculations, you know, and all that. Because interest in these schemes is ended on a daily basis, you know, so you make sure that all those things are checked, you know. So where there are gaps, yes, ensure they are genuine gaps. Without that, you know, you can have, you know, some uh, losing end on that. So the contributions, as we said, make sure you check on it, you know, as you plan for your retirement. And then the update of beneficiary, yes, he indicates that clearly. But let me add more uh, to it uh, clarity. You know, when it comes to beneficiary uh, update, you know, most people would take a back seat on that, but I'm sure we know just the biblical could say that leave an inheritance to your children, children. Yes, this particular nomination for you may not be there, you know. So yes, of course, death benefit don't come directly to the individual, but you know, your uh, the, the, uh, beneficiary. It serves as a will. Even when you come to the regulator, that's MPRA mandate to the trustees is that the first point of document we should use to make any benefit payment is what the nominated form. So the people you put in there in your nomination are critical uh, what instrument or a document or evidence that a trustee can use. You know, even the letter of administration and others are seen as secondary. You know, so you can see that it's very important that we do that. And then making sure that this adds up to what 100%. Uh, look at what I indicated here. I said when the person is young, you know, you give him much uh, a higher percentage. And when the person's hold, you know, you give him lower uh, percentage. It's quite fairly uh, important that probably the idea is that probably if the younger uh, may be in school, you know, they may, there will be the need to have more money, you know, so that this person, you know, can finish school. So just have those, some of our ideas when you are doing this 100% allocation to your members and then try to certify all interests. Very important, you know, uh, uh, sometimes when you are looking at death benefit payment and all that, you see that, yes, one of the spouse may not um, name the other spouse, but eventually when there are issues like children below 18 years, you know, uh, they end up the money going to them when it comes to the issue of uh, in transfer because the children may not have their own bank account, you know. Uh -huh. So as much as possible, it, for, for me, the data that we see mostly is what, well, it cuts across both ways. So it's not like, oh, the ladies alone. No, the men too, sometimes you have it, you know, having that problem where they may have a, a spouse, you know, but they may not name them, name some other people. So please, this information that we are requesting that in your retirement planning, make sure they are, they are in that, you are checking the member up, there are regular things going on. You know, you can do them online, like we said at the moment. You can also visit it, visit our offices, for example, the enterprise office, and then even the health sector office. Now we have office in Kumasi, we have office in Accra. You know, all these places are outlets that, you know, you can go. Enterprise is located almost uh, uh, about four or five uh, 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 regions in the country. So you can always visit there, you know, so that these updates are done. And usually to our educational committee, like Madam Pep said, you know, go runs to various facilities. When they come run, please try as much as possible to approve them, update the member details. They are very important, very important in your retirement planning. Don't leave them to chance because like we are saying, you may not be there especially when it comes to member nominated beneficiary. And then so that all the litigation, you know, all that problem that comes up, you know, at least will be at peace. Thank you so much. This is all that I want to indicate when it comes to member update and then beneficiary details. Thank you so much. We are ready for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Andres Ablobi. He told me not to use the doctor for now, so I decided not to mention it. If you saw me struggling with his name, I wanted to say Dr. Andres Ablobi. He says I should use Mr. Andres Ablobi for now. So thank you so much for um, that presentation. I think we have all learned the importance of having to update our beneficiary list at any point in time, because um, we don't control life. We may not be there always. And um, it brings a lot of solace for your soul if you are not there knowing that you've done the right thing and your beneficiaries 
and the right beneficiaries are going to receive your contribution in the scheme. At this time, we are going to take the, the questions in the Q&A um, chat box and we have a number of them. Um, uh, this one is coming to you, Mr. Ransford, and uh, particularly Ellen wanted to know, uh, or she wanted you to throw more light on the tax waiver you mentioned and who qualifies and how one can claim it. A similar question also came from Anita Barbara. So if you can answer that and then we move ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. So the, the tax waiver that I mentioned um, it exists um, for the tier three contributions, be provident fund or personal pensions. Okay, so as an individual, how you can enjoy this tax exemption or this tax waiver would be to sign on to a personal pension scheme, which falls under the three tier pension structure. So for our colleagues here that, um, uh, that received their rem their remuneration from controller and accountant general, we now have the opportunity to um, assign mandates for deductions to be effected on your payroll for your personal pensions through controller. So you sign up to a personal pensions and the deduction will be effected by a controller. Now, before the deductions are effected or before your basic is taxed, these deductions are taken out. So your tier, your tier two deductions are taken out and your tier three personal pensions deductions will also be taken out before the remaining amount will be taxed. So that's where you are making savings or, or you are making savings on the taxes or that's where you're enjoying the tax waiver. Your contributions are um, are deducted before the rest of your basic is taxed. Okay, so you can enjoy it from um, deductions from source if you have, if you sign up to personal pensions because it's part of the three tier um, pension structure. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we had a question from um, David Sum, and this one um, it says. Contribution to the scheme. How do I contribute to the HSOPS scheme once I uh, emigrate from Ghana? And the, there was one from Samson Yali um, on wanting to know the highest amount paid out to a nurse um, at any point in time. And then how do you qualify, at what level do you qualify for benefits? Uh, do you really qualify for benefits in the HSOPS? after contributing for 15 years. And there is one from Florence uh, Bansa, um, who is requesting for recording. A number of them have asked for the slides. And Bill Camben also wants to know whether um, the HSOPS uh, is in arrears in terms of government contribution. So this one, it's more tailored towards um, our HSOPS um, operations. And I don't know whether chairman would want to um, comment on any of them. Otherwise, I can take it up with um, Andrews. Okay, just just a quick one. Um, the first one I would want to mention has to do with um, once you migrate out of Ghana, uh, contributions towards the tier two. Uh, currently, as uh, the presenter, uh, Mr. Matikoli mentioned. Uh, the first two are mandatory, uh, but they're actually employer-sponsored scheme. The third tier is actually a, pensioner, a personal pension. So what we do is to encourage that you sign on to a personal uh, pension where you can regularly contribute, even if you have migrated out of Ghana, so that anytime you come back, you have some funds that are already uh, stored up for you. Uh, then the bit about those, you said you contribute for 15 years, can you uh, claim? Uh, so the first two, it's the, you only claim when you retire uh, because it's a retirement, uh, it's, it's, this is pensions meant for retirement and they are ground for retirement. Um, for instance, if you gain mandatory age of uh, 60 or when you have to go on um, early uh, voluntary retirement due to whatever reason or the other after the age of at the after the age of 55 or if you have to you are permanently incapacitated because you're unable to work uh, for which reason maybe due to ill health or something for which reason you have had 
a certified board uh, clear you. Or those who are expatriates who are migrating back to their countries. If you're a Ghanaian and you are migrating, uh, you do not qualify. So it's not, be, it's not about how long you contribute, uh, but whether or not you have retired. It is meant to be able to protect you when you retire and not funds you can just um, get access and then take it at any point in time. When you allow that, uh, people may retire, may not be able to have any funds to live on. However, the third tier, the, uh, the third tier, which is the personal pensions the, and the others, those are funds you can actually uh, tap into after 10 years of, of uh, signing on. Uh, thank you. I think if there is anything, Andrews can finish it up. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Derek Amwati. Um, Ellen wanted to know whether she can add up to her tier two contributions in terms of the premium. And we also had Mary Jane Fee. Um, she wants to know whether there are any uh, recommendations for institutions uh, in terms of their employers towards contribution of uh, employees pension. So, um, Andrew, can you take okay, that? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Madam Pep, for uh, uh, this opportunity. Yes, uh, in answering this, let me uh, try to add quickly uh, to the first one, as uh, Chairman said. Um, with this tier two, because it's mandatory, as said by the earlier, you can see that there are certain grounds. Uh -huh, that you can be able to uh, apply for the benefit. And those grants, as chairman laid them, uh, when there is an issue of the person leaving. Uh -huh. So yes, the minimum you can, you can start applying is from age 55, just as uh, people can apply for. And then there are cases where, where you are very much uh, unemployed, for example, at age 50, the law allows that we can pay that benefit. But then that's why it, it, it involves a long process. You have to go to labor office, declare that you are unemployed. Then also, it, there's a provision for uh, using your tier two for mortgage. By the moment, we are still in the early stage of developing that product as of now. So we have a long way going on that aspect. So there are various ways that you can apply you know, for your benefit. But don't forget, like Chairman said, this is a mandatory one. So the only option mainly is what at retirement or certain event, like we said, death can occur or incapacitated. All those periods can be paid. Now, the issue of whether or um, you can add on to your tier two. Yet tier two is based on 5%, it's mandatory, don't forget, 5% of your salary. The question is whether basic or gross, it depends on your employer and then what uh, the employer is, is showing and that the tax is being paid on. You know, some institutions currently pay on, on their gross, some institutions pay on their basic. Uh -huh. So it should be 5% of your earning. Uh -huh. But the question is, what about the SS? You can always invest the SS in the tier two. So you are allowed to always put the SS in the tier two, hey, tier three, sorry. That's why there are three vehicles that you can always, you know, try to expand on. Now, the issue that you raised earlier about IRS. Yes, um, as generally as we know, based on the economy situations, but we have not as a scheme. I know this board have not tried to disadvantage members at any point in time. Uh -huh. So instead of waiting for the last payment to come, for people to be paid, currently what the scheme does is that once your money comes, hey, once your letter comes that you are retiring, immediately the board has made sure that you know your money is paid whilst we wait for what the IRS that is come. Uh -huh. So whether the IRS or not, uh, as much as possible, yes, they don't affect uh, uh, the prompt payment of your uh, benefit. I'm sure that is what most people when you retire, Cash flow is a major issue, and we don't, you know, delay when it comes to that. Like I said, there's a robust system in place uh, that actually, you know, process this as much as possible. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I will need you to follow it up with uh, how to check that your tier two contribution. Because this question has come from Elbrus Taylor. It has also come from Patrick Kodo and a few others. They want to understand how they can check their tier two contributions, and then we move on with the other questions. Okay. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, at this stage, like I did indicate, it's one of the frequent things that you can always do. 
you know, we have offices all over the place. Like I said, in enterprise, that's our trustees. Hey, our uh, administrators are in, even in uh, Tamale, you know, uh, they are in the Takradi, they are in Kumasi, you know. So all these are areas. They have even agencies that go around. Now, when it comes to we the board, we have secretaries that are open, you know, uh, Monday to Friday, uh, they start from, and then we have telephone numbers also that you can contact at any time. So to uh, uh, check on your statement, you can always walk in, which we know that most, about 90% of our members, when they are applying for benefit, always want to do that part where they want to interact with somebody before they finally, you know, uh, submit the, the application. Though you can download, you can do whatever. So please, uh, these are all messages. You can call, there's a always call line, you know, enterprise one is even, always even, it seems, uh, I don't want to say, it, it, they close very late, uh -huh. so uh, you can always call in, you know. Uh -huh. So those are, are uh, channels that you can always contact uh, the board or the administrator for further information on statement. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So um, we are moving on with the questions and we have one from, um, I think this anonymous attendee, we have answered your question on updating of beneficiaries online. Um, you can actually visit the member portal on the Health Sector Occupational Pension Scheme. You enter with your membership ID number and you can go into the system. You can see your statement, print it if you want to, and all of that. Um, the website is always available. If you just Google Health Sector Occupational Pension Scheme, it will pop up and you can go to the membership portal and use it, meaning you can check all this at the comfort of your home, at the office, at work, any free period that you have, you can check on these. And in terms of the earlier question on the advice um, to employers, I think because the tier two is mandatory. So um, at the end of every month, it's expected that your 5% contribution will go through controller and be transferred into the schemes on your behalf. Um, those that sometimes serve as a concern to us are the IGF staff or the casual staff in the various health facilities. And we have tried time and time and again to let all these institutions understand whether it's a Ghana Health Service, um, it's a child institution, a teaching hospital, or any other uh, institution to understand that uh, it is your responsibility per the law to pay the tier two contributions for your staff. So even if they are not on government payroll and they are working with you, at the end of every month, you are supposed to gather all of this and pay it into the schemes custodian account with the list of names. That tells us that um, out of the total amount of money you are paying, and this is the allocation. Um, Kofi gets 20 CDs, this one gets that, this one get, gets that. So that is uh, the advice we'll give to um, all employers or institutional heads who may have also joined us on this call. Um, we are not dealing with SNET matters, but SNET also has various platforms that you can check your statements and it is, uh, that information is readily available anywhere. You can just Google and you get that information. Um, there are many of you who have also asked questions about Tier three contributions. Tier three is not uh, mandatory, it is voluntary. So it is up to you to make a contribution into a tier three scheme, which may be established within your union or within a, your facility or elsewhere. And um, the more you have all these contributions and investments going on, the more you can secure your, your future in terms of your financial situation as a retiree. So let's take advantage of all these avenues that are available to us and then um, we can benefit in the future. Um, Frederick Odro wants to know whether you can still pay your tier two with enterprise if you are no longer in the public service. I think this question has already been answered. If you are not in the public service, you know the contributions come through controller, which is a uh, government payroll. So if you are not there and you have you find yourself in a, in a private in a private institution, I'm sure that private institution will also have a tier two um, scheme in place because there are a lot of private tier two schemes. 
If it is there, what you can do is request for uh, porting. We can port whatever you, you have contributed so far over here to that scheme so that you continue it over there. Or you can leave whatever contribution you have made so far within the HSOPS. It will grow and then you contribute over there. At the time of retirement, you can take from here and take from there as well. Um, we have um, um, Na Bakiyama. Uh, you are thanking us for this program and we thank you too for joining. Um, that's, like I said, we are not doing SNIT here. So um, I'm sorry, this is Health Sector Occupational Pension Scheme and we cannot be answering um, questions on SNIT. Abdul Nafiu uh, wants to know what happens to a workers' pension contribution, particularly tier three contributions, if he or she dies. Um, every scheme, including the tier three schemes, this one is the mandatory tier two scheme for all health workers. But the tier three, it also had, they all collect data on beneficiaries. So if you die, um, you should have updated your beneficiary list, just like uh, our speakers told us. And then those beneficiaries will have a right to apply for your, your contribution and it will be paid to them, pay your instruction on your um, beneficiary nomination form. For the Health Sector Occupational Pension Scheme, this form is available on our websites and you can always um, go and look at the details. You can go into the member portal and also update your, your, your beneficiaries at any point in time. Madam Pepe, if I can help you on that a bit on the dev Okay, order. you can add up. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you know, um, yes, we said that, that's one of the uh, uh, benefits that normally takes uh, quite some time because the actual beneficiary uh, does, is not there directly. Uh, but from health sector, because it's a, a, a regulated system, MPRA or the regulator has put in a certain criteria of how benefits should be uh, paid. Uh -huh. And one of the mandate or one of the main thing is to look out for the beneficiary uh, or nominated form. That's why in this uh, call, we are saying that ensure that the people you want to get a benefit are uh, uh, named. So that is one, one of the documents who will pay the benefit is based on that. The other aspect is you, you may not be there, but you say that the uh, nurse of kin or the direct beneficiary or a family relative, you know, in our, we have a, a benefit policy. In the policy, you will see that it follow with the act where there are certain category of people that can qualify for the benefits. Uh -huh. So in doing that, um, you have to bear in mind that you can't transfer your benefit to your girlfriend or something where you have your children. You know, the, the act is specifically about who and who to, when you are in matrilinear or in your, your patrilinear family, there are strict process of who and who should benefit under that. But the mandate is in your hands, like we said, you have to go, regularly update those beneficiaries. And then those people who apply to us and then attach those benefits, you know, uh, the details, the evidence that the board is, and then go through that process and then that is paid. But usually it's one of the uh, benefit process that keep long. Apart from that, the others are uh, a straight process. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Andrew Sabrobi. That's one I think Ransford, and Mr. Ransford, particularly, you can help us with it. Both uh, Dr. Eng, Engman and Millicent Boahine wants to know whether there are uh, any lucrative uh, investment opportunities out there that they can take advantage of in terms of uh, personal pensions or um, uh, personal pensions, yes, or in terms of tier three. Okay, um, thank you, Perpetua. I'm smiling because I think you know what the obvious answer is going to be. I'm going to say, Sign up to a personal pension with enterprise trustees, and um, <laughs> because you already have, uh, you're already on that, we're already managing your tier two. You have some experience with a uh, level of administration, so it's not new to you. So I'll say yes, you can sign on to um, the enterprise personal pension plan, 
um, via our short code star 714 star 333 hash with um, perpetual permission we'll put it in the um, chat area so everybody can see so you just um, dial the short code and then you follow through um, the prompts and you can also request for an advisor to engage you okay thank you thank you very much and as the team working behind the scenes will be putting up that short code i'll also request them to put up the short code for um, checking statements, HSOPS statements as well, so that um, those on the call can pick up that short code and use it after this webinar. Regina Pele, unfortunately, will not be able to answer your questions for you. It's all about SNIT. And like I said, this is Health Sector Occupational Pension Scheme. So it will be difficult for us to answer this question. Ignatius, uh, Aklipe, um, you are talking about your difficulty with um, your difficulty with porting. Just leave your number. Just send us your number. Uh, send your number to directly to the panelists. We'll pick it up from there, and we'll get to you later to resolve help you resolve that. Henry Oti uh, is saying, "Can we explain the tax?" waiver bit. I think this has been explained already. Um, it's all about uh, tax rate. Does the nurses fund save the tier three role? That's your other question. Yes, it does. Um, there's this up from one and Moscow um, attendee. What are the things to consider when planning on the type of private job one would like to do after retirement so as to still earn a regular income that will further boost all pension benefits and investments one has acquired. When is the best time to start the private job um, one would like to do after retirement? Should one start alongside with active service or after active service? What are some examples of the best types of private jobs one can do after retirement. Um, this one, Ms. Ransford, Matikoli, I'll hand that over to you to answer. I wonder if you can uh, really give us those specific jobs that are, are going to earn us more money, more money to prepare towards retirement, yes. <laughs> I would say it's um it's an entirely personal decision, okay. But um, from where I sit, I would what, what I would ask you is why do you want to work in your retirement? That's what it is. It's retirement. That's when you're supposed to be resting and enjoying the fruits of your labor. So you've worked hard. You've um built up your retirement portfolio. You don't need to go. You don't need to go into active um, um employment when you retire. You could take up consultancy services, which are very, very relaxed. Um, you can consult with, um, depending on your area of expertise. So you can consult regularly for groups and associations and other organizations and whatnot. But it shouldn't be a full-time thing because you, now you've hit 60. Very soon, you're going to be 65. Your health is you know, declining. This is not a time to now be going into active employment. You're waking up at 5 a.m., 4 a.m. to drive through the traffic and it's not the time retirement is for rest so invest very well in your active working life so you can enjoy that um you can enjoy that time and luxury and your funds when you retire thank you perpetual uh madam can i add to that quickly okay <laughs> yes um you know um i also share that view that um yes when is is at retirement you 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 need to um have something to do like uh, the questioner was asking. I believe that, um, yes, you you can work moderately. In some country like UK and others, now they don't even have age for a retirement. You know, they are not, the employers are not compulsory to sack you and say, oh, you are this age and go away. You know, whenever you want, you know, you can go. Uh -huh. So have that shared concern that, yes, the question he raised, you can always be active. You know, it keeps you uh, uh, healthy also. So there are things like your area of expertise. That's why I always look at your area of expertise. Start from there. Uh, you don't go and start new ventures that you have not tried. Like people will say, oh, I want to go and do farming. But all this time you have been a nurse, right? And all this time you have been a doctor. All this time you have been a physician or something. Uh, your area of expertise, make sure that you learn it and you are expert in that area as much as possible. 
you know, I mean, so that uh, you can do it on your own. You know, I remember being in a field where you meet people like nurses who have, uh, in their retirement, they are continuing their job. Pharmacy who have opened, you know, uh, chemist shops and all that, you know, so you, you, you can get something to do, you know, for example, uh, starting your own business, working on some part-time, you know, like he said, this is not a time to take up a full-time job, but there are so many avenues. I believe that it's a time to uh, 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 do what you want as much as possible and make sure that the cash flow keep coming, as I keep saying, cash flow is very key at that time. So uh, you have to start planning as we indicated, but that options, uh, uh, make sure that you start from where you are working currently, where you are trained, rather than going to a different field completely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Andrew Sablobi. So, um, Stephen Kwaki and Benjamin Tichi have been asking about um, uh, areas, uh, the cont our contributions that are in areas, and whether we are doing anything about it as HSOPS. All these, um, maybe I can see Chairman's video. You want to, you want to respond to it. I, I will leave that for you. Yeah, okay. And then when you finish it, kindly add um there's this question about the current situation um the economy in terms of the ddp and all that how safe is our investment that one is from rosafilo adoma thank you okay so thank you very much pep i uh, when it comes to delaying contributions i think this is a perpetual problem we have had um since the scheme started and uh, we're doing everything possible to try and reduce it. Uh, but we're all aware of the problems that are going on in the economy. And because of that, uh, there are significant delays when it comes to contributions uh, from government and other employers uh, within the health sector. What the scheme does is to significantly, um, one, uh, we, we have demand notices that we send to the employer all the time, every month. Uh, we have a system in place where we follow up with controller. Uh, then together with the labor front in the health sector, there are several engagements we are making with the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations. All of these geared towards getting governments and other employers to pay arrears, uh, contributions that are in arrears. Um, I, I can't say we have succeeded fully yet, uh, but we are making steady strides. We hope that uh, with, I mean, we, that the economy will recover soon, and we hope that very soon all of these areas will be cleared uh, so that the contributor will ultimately benefit from it. When it comes to uh, DDEP and um, all that is happening, one, the first thing I must state is, one, you should uh, rest assured that your funds are safe. Uh, we, 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 we are not losing. Nobody is going to lose uh, your, your basic funds. No, the funds are safe. What has happened when they come uh, has to do with the ability to get um, these coupons and maturities paid on time. Uh, that's why the essence of the DDEP and all had been to try and get um, get these uh, investors to change the tenor, to be able to adjust it a bit so that it can allow um, uh, government and other employer, I mean, other invest, um, yes, others in to be able to pay, make these payments. We are looking at it closely. As you are aware, uh, pensions were given waiver when it comes to the uh, domestic debt exchange. Uh, all, pen, all funds within the pension scheme were given a waiver, which we are still enjoying. Uh, we have had a few delays when it comes to some of the uh, coupon payments. Uh, we are working as a board uh, together with labor actively on it to hope and hope that very soon all of those in arrears uh, will be paid. Thank you, Prep. You can take up. You are muted. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Derek Amwate. So the questions keep coming, but at this moment, I'm going to call on uh, Mr. Kofi Asmenin um, Sechi, who is also with Enterprise Trustees, uh, Scheme Administrators, to explain briefly 
because there have been a number of questions and the ones that have not been read out, there are a number of them that are asking about how they can access their contributions or check their statements online or update their beneficiary list, the process or how to maneuver um, online. So Kofi, please, you have the, the floor. All right, thank you very much, Madam Perpetual, for this opportunity. Uh, as has been indicated, there is an online portal that allows both members and even employers to assess contributions for themselves and on behalf of their employees. Now, for the employers, when we sign you on, you can go to the Health Sector Occupational Pension Scheme website www.hsopsghana.com. When you go to that page, you go to member login. At the member login section, it will require you to register either as a member or an employer. So you go through the registration process. Once you are able to register as a member, you are able to see your account and then you are able to view your statements, update beneficiary information, update your nominees as well, and also do some pensions pro projections. So that is what a member can do on the online portal. Equally, the employer also has access to this particular online portal. Most of the times we hear members wanting to find out about the status of their statement. For instance, they have no idea. So what we do is that once we set your employer contact up in our system, especially for the IGF contributors, they have access to be able to view all member statements. So should a member not be able to view their statements themselves, you can equally work to your employer contact and they will be able to show you your statement, take you through the process and you can equally download your statement as well as each member has a membership certificate that tells you that you are a member of the health sector occupational pension scheme. So once you register online, these are some of the information or details that each member can have access to on the online portal. For those who are not, who, who may not have time to go on the online portal, just like it is, there's a USSD code. But however, you know how USSD codes operate. They provide you with some simple basic information. So by dialing star 714 star 33 hash, star 714 star 33 hash, you follow the prompt, you register on the portal, it will confirm your number in a database, if indeed you are in a database. Then you can then go in and view your closing statement. You can also view your member information as we have in the system. So when you check your member information and there's something wrong with it, you can reach out to the administrator and we can help you correct some information on your, in, on your member whilst going through the star 714 star 333 hash. One other new avenue we are looking at, and with, with, with Chairman, with your permission, we know others also like the app, for instance. So currently, we are currently working on an app for the Health Sector Occupational Pension Scheme. I'm sure soon that app will be also be launched. That is also another avenue where it makes it much more simpler for members to view their statement certificate and do some of this beneficiary update. Should you try and have any challenge, once you go to the Health Sector website, there's a call center line that is there. Please call, reach out to any of our customer service agents and they'll be able to take you through the process. Thank you very much, Madam Perpetua. Um, thank you very much. And we thank you very much, Kofi. We have um, questions from Julia Sapon and Francis Fahadi. They, they have constantly posted that question. They want to understand the difference between the tier three and then the tier three. The, the tier three, they said tier three and senate, but the truth of the matter is um, the health sector occupational pension scheme is tier two. So maybe what you want to say is that you want to understand the difference between uh, tier two and, uh, and senate. So what you need to understand is that basically um, the tier one, which is run by senate and the tier two, in our case as health workers, which is run by the Health Sector Occupational Pension Scheme. They are both mandatory schemes, but the only difference is that since the um, enforcement of the, of the law and the initiation of the um, pension reforms, when you go on retirement, since 
January 2020, you will take your lump sum from tier two, which in this case is the health sector occupational pension scheme. And then subsequently after retirement, your monthly pension will come from tier one, which is run by SNIT. So that is, uh, that is the difference. But we recognize the fact that there are some people who have been working um, in the system for a couple of years at the time when SNIT was handling everything. So um, although the scheme took effect in 2020, when you go on, for such persons, when they go on retirement, they will have claims from SNIT and they will have equally have claims from um, the health sector occupational pension scheme. Their claim from tier, uh, from tier one, that is the SNIT, is regarded as uh, past credits. They will go apply for that and then come and take their lump sum from uh, the health sector occupational pension scheme as tier two also. There are a number of questions we will not be able to handle at all. Um, we are soon going to wrap up, but I'll just take um, one or two and then we can, we can end this webinar. So um, there was a question from, um, from Abigail Delali, uh, who said something about uh, enterprise trustees. Let me assure you, this is a scheme and we, we actually assign all uh, service providers, not only enterprise. We have a custodian and we have two fund managers. We all assign them periods that they can work, which is signed into a contract. And they have um, KPIs that they are supposed to achieve within the period. And we monitor them on daily basis. So in, when it comes to your, your money, when it comes to HSOPs, we don't have any problem um, in terms of our, our dealings with these uh, service providers. So let me just assure you that you don't have any problem and we all don't have any problem when it comes to the health sector occupational pension scheme and our service providers. Um, Samson Yali, you have repeated your questions severally. Um, the lump sum that we have paid out, these are not information that we give out um, on webinars. I think at our last AGM last year, as part of the report, these kinds of information were, were given out as reports at AGM. God willing, there will be an AGM next year and we will give out those information as well. So if you want to understand um, who has, uh, or which professional has received the highest amount uh, paid out within the, the health sector operational pension scheme since its operations, understand that um, it is, information that is given out at AGMs or annual general meetings. Um, in terms of um, um, how, many, how many months is government owing in arrears in total? Uh, uh, please, uh, Mr. Andres Ablobi, please take that. I'll give that to you. Um, there's a question on, can I claim my benefits after 60 years when I return to Ghana? Yes, of course, if you are outside Ghana and you, you have already contributed here, when you retire and you, once you hit the age of 60, you can apply and claim whatever you have, you have within the scheme that has been running as investments for you. Um, and Dr. Coleman says, if I have done 14 years of tier one and tier two contributions before leaving the country, are there any arrangements for me to continue? I think we've answered that question in the previous answers. Um, Melissa Wahima, please, how can I access the tier one and tier two when one leaves the country? Um, I think we have explained that already. I think most of the questions left are just repetitions. So I'll give Mr. Andrew Abdobi the opportunity to answer the question that I just posed to him, and then we'll come to um, the chairman of the board of trustees for some closing remarks, and then we'll end the webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Madam, Madam President uh, Perpetua. Um, yes, um, the last payment uh, we received from uh, government as a scheme is September 2022. And that's the last payment we've actually received. Uh -huh. So, uh, but from health sector, because we have IGF also, 
uh, normally the IGF are like people who are directly employed by the facilities and all that. So those people uh, do comes. Uh -huh. So directly to the question, I can say that September 2022. So you can do the math roughly it's about eight or so far, seven to eight months, you know, uh, roughly in areas. Uh -huh. So that's what uh, directly to that question. Then also you ask a question whether you are outside. Yeah, you can always make contributions when you are outside. You can make sure that it's really tier three, you know, but tier two, the way it is, is that uh, because of the purposes of uh, having your basic salary and then making sure that five percent and the nature of it being mandatory uh -huh. but the question is okay maybe you are working here already and then you had a transfer to another country to be there for a short while and come back yes you can always make us once you are receiving salary you know with your employer yes they can continue to pay you know so uh as a, a scheme i can say that like as we did indicated you have a, a benefit, another benefit called porting where wherever you are because it's a defined contribution scheme, you can always move along with your scheme. That's a, a unique benefit. Unlike the SNIT, where you can move with your benefits, it's always stuck in one place. But with this, uh, when you are joining, you can bring from wherever, when you are leaving also, you know. But remember, for porting, it is scheme to scheme. We don't pay to individual accounts. It's not a retirement. That's what I can add to this, Madam Vep. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And let me add that uh, the laws in various countries related to pensions are different. They are never the same. So um, take recognition of that fact because um, we, we, based on our own laws, it may, may be quite difficult to get your employer in a certain jurisdiction to pay a certain percentage of your contribution here. So most of you who have contributed into the HSOPS already and you intend to migrate or have migrated already, um, you can focus on your pensions out there and then um, get involved, get involved in personal pensions and other forms of pensions so that you can contribute more to your, your pensions. At this time, um, we will go over to the chairman of the board of trustees in the person of Dr. Derek Amwatin to give us some closing um, remarks. So thank you very much, uh, Pep, once again. Uh, for, it's been an exciting time we've had together. Uh, I want to say thank you to all the presenters. Um, we, we've had, we, we've been talking about an overview of uh, pensions, uh, basically an overview of retirement and how to plan uh, for your retirement. As you mentioned, Pep mentioned earlier, this is just the beginning of many other engagements uh, that will come. I'm sure they will announce the date for other webinars before we leave here. Uh, but going out of here, one thing still lingers on in my mind uh, that you need to take your uh, retirement seriously. A lot of us, when uh, we are young, we think retirement is 20 years, it's 30 years, it's 40 years away. And so we do not take any interest in anything retirement or anything pensions. But I think it is important that we do and we start early. Some of the tips that Mr. Matekole uh, provided, the fact that you must start early, you must start early by all means. You must get a savings mindset and you must plan. You need to define your retirement and you need to protect your savings. Uh, these are very, very good uh, tidbits that will help every one of us if we take them seriously. I am sure as we go along, there are specific areas we will be handling within the year in uh, subsequent webinars. And I want to encourage you and your friends and family to be part of these sessions. Uh, we are here to assure you that the Health Sector Occupational Pension Scheme is here for you. We are here for your interest. You can reach us at any time. We have an office at Zoti in Kolebu. Uh, we also have one in Kumase, and uh, we are available virtually. You can get us online and in all the media outlets, social media outlets that have been provided. And whenever you have concern, just walk to us, we will address it. Uh, we wish you good life, we wish you good retirement, take care of yourselves, and hopefully as you learn to save small, to save early, uh, we will all retire smiling together. Thank you very much, and God bless you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Derek Mwate, and that's the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Health Sector Occupational Patients Team. So um, just like we told you at the beginning, this is a webinar series coming your way um, under the auspices of the Education Committee of the Health Sector Occupational Pension Scheme. We are about ending the first webinar or as part of the first, the first series. And the second series will be coming, the second uh, one is coming up on the 17th of August, 17th of August, 2023. And on that day, we are going to take you through the stages of retirement planning and investment choices to consider. So we will look at all the stages of retirement and the investment choices to consider. So those of you who have been asking questions about what can I do, what job can I do and all of that, or what investment can I make and all of that, you will be hearing a lot more of it in our second webinar, which will come up on the 17th of August, 2023. So on this note, we thank you all so much for joining today's webinar. It's been very interactive in terms of the many questions that you have asked. Um, we thank you all very much for joining. Without you, this webinar would not have been a success. We thank our speakers for today. Um, that is Mr. Ransford, particularly from Enterprise Trustees, the new business wing, advisory wing, and then Mr. Andrews Ablobi, also our independent trustee for being with us today. And most especially, we thank the chairman of the board, Dr. Derek Martin, for joining and the other board of trustees who are on the call. And we thank the education committee of the health sector occupational pension scheme for the effort at bringing contributors of the scheme, this webinar series. So on this note, thank you all very much for joining and we ask that you stay safe. When we talk about health sector occupational pension scheme, we say retire with a smile. Thank you all very much for joining and bye-bye for now. Bye. <laughs> bye. Sophie, you can end the webinar now, please. Thank you.